Please welcome His Excellency Mr. Musa Faki Mohamed, Chairperson of the African Union Commission. Her Excellency Mrs. Sarah Kugon Gelwa Amadila, Prime Minister of the Republic of Namibia, representing His Excellency Mr. Nangolo Mbumba, President of the Republic of Namibia. His Excellency Mr. Mohamed Yunus El Menfi, President of the Presidential Council of the State of Libya. His Excellency, Mr. Paul Kagame, President of the Republic of Rwanda. And last but certainly not the least, His Excellency, Dr. William Samoy Ruto, President of the Republic of Kenya. Thank you, Excellencies, for joining us on this panel. Uh, just a few rules here. One, because we are running behind time by probably almost 50 minutes. Uh, each one of you will have about three minutes to respond to each of the questions that are posed to you. But I'd like to kickstart this dialogue, first of all, with a question for President Ruto. Um, just last week, you took America by storm. Uh, you were the talk of the town for a considerable amount of time in Atlanta and in Washington, D.C., the first African leader to go on a state visit to Washington, D.C. in 50 years. From all indications, a very, very successful mission. And we say congratulations to you and to Kenya. Now, for quite a while, you've been a very vocal advocate for reforming the global financial architecture. And we've heard much from you today. You've pretty much given us a tour de force of what Africa needs. Now, considering that that change and not as quick as we anticipated or want it to be, in terms of priorities in the short term, what do you think? Africa should focus on and what should be the major priorities moving forward. Thank you very much. And again, let me take this opportunity to welcome all of us to Nairobi and Kenya. Um, it is said that half the solution to a problem is identifying that there exists a problem. For a very long time, many people did not admit that there was something fundamentally wrong with the international financial architecture. In fact, initially, when voices were raised, they were dismissed. But I want to say today we are very proud, those of us, especially from this continent, who raised our voices, that today, the conversation in the world is no longer whether we have a fit for purpose international financial architecture. Everybody admits that there is something fundamentally wrong with it. The issue in conversation now is where, how do we reform it? So the issue of reform is settled. It must be done. And I think it begins with once we understand the problem, then it begins with where do we start? I think what we are saying is we need a financial architecture that has the following characteristics. Number one, long-term financing. 40 years, grace period, 10 years, or something in that order. Number two, low interest rates concessional financing, including, where possible, um, grants. Number three, we also need financing at scale. The quantum 
is very important. And then number four, we also need financing that is agile, that is flexible, especially that responds, that is climate sensitive. So that if there are shocks, that financial architecture must be responsive because climate change is the new normal. Switching from drought to floods progressively is becoming what it is. In Kenya, we had drought a year ago that decimated two and a half million heads of livestock. This year, we are in floods that has taken the lives of 200 Kenyans. So this is the new reality. So the financial architecture that must be in place must respond to this climate reality that we have. And finally, is to be sensitive to sustainability. So our priority is to sort out the financial architecture, that's number one. Number two, our priority is to make sure that this continent, with its tremendous potential, we move it from potential to opportunity, from opportunity to investment. And finally, as I have said, even as we try to do something outside, we must also do something inside. That is why we are also looking at our own systems, our own governance, our own instruments. And that's why we are discussing, even internally, reform of the African Union, so that we are aligned as we reform the international financial architecture, as we reform the investment space to create opportunity for our uh, assets, we must also reform our own institutions so that we align them and repurpose them to be in line with our aspirations and the outcomes we are looking for. Uh, thank you very much, President Ruto. In other words, reform is a two-way street. It's not just one, one way. Um, but allow me to follow up very quickly. As we all know, Kenya and a number of other countries have been buffeted very devastatingly by extreme weather conditions, unpredictable weather conditions. And I think the projections for Kenya and other countries in the region are that over the next seven years, we're still likely to see the same kind of weather patterns that we've seen this year. That being the case, and again, uh, following a two-way reform process, what is it that African countries should be doing right now to mitigate the effects of climate change? It is true that predictions are that Kenya and our region is going to have above normal rains for the next seven years. That's a prediction. It is both positive and negative. And that is why working with institutions like the Africa Development Bank, we are developing resilience instruments. It is the reason why we are having a conversation with the Africa Development Bank on our water infrastructure. How do we take care of this excess water? And how do we turn this excess water into an asset for making sure that we use it for our food security, we use it for the positive elements. So we must align our programs, our strategies with the reality of the moment and with the predicted reality of the future. So that is the alignment that we must do. Thank you very much, President Ruto. Um, I'm gonna to come to President Kagame next on a number of issues, particularly with regards to the global financial architecture, as well as the issue of reforms, both yourself and President Ruto have been aligned. That being the case, what reforms do you really think should pave the way for giving Africa the resources that it needs to finance its own transformation and inclusive growth, either even in the face of devastating climate change. 
what are, what are the most critical reforms that you see and anticipate are needed? Thank you. Let me quickly, first of all, and more importantly, thank uh, our hosts, uh, President Ruto, His Excellency, and uh, also the President of the Africa Development Bank Group uh, for inviting us here. Now, quickly to the point, we are talking about uh, the architecture of well, international financial architecture. Therefore, in mind, we have the architects. So what did the architect have in mind when uh, they provided us with the architecture we have to deal with? Uh, they must have had their own interests. They must have framed things the way uh, they wanted to benefit themselves, or maybe we can assume that they wanted to benefit the whole world. Now, we are here discussing the situation as it is, uh, where we find there are enormous resources in this world, but inequitably distributed. So Africa has to look at itself and look at the whole world as is set up. And we know in this world, people, countries, uh, work for interests, their own interests. Africa's interests and uh, the countries of our continent interests must be taken care of beginning with ourselves. So, and we talk about speaking with one voice many times. It has to be one voice. It has also to be loud and clear and effective. For that to happen, we think about working together. We think about representation. And representation is not also just numbers. It's being able to speak out loudly and uh, representing ourselves rather than having other people represent us. Mm. So it starts from what has been talked about that is very important, whether it was in the speech of uh, His Excellency President Ruto and uh, His Excellency Musa Faki. The, Therefore, the reforms we are talking about is how do we disrupt, if you will, the current architecture as we have it, so that it includes significantly and visibly the interests of our continent. Our continent, whether it is the human resources or natural resources, or any resources are thinking about. How can anyone interested in the well-being of the people of this world sideline our continent? In actual fact, if you look at uh, the facts as they are, in a few decades, the only place in this world that will be having a growing middle class is Africa, mm. the only one. So it is even in the interest of the rest of the world that has marginalized Africa to contribute to the well-being of our continent because the growth of Africa based on this middle class feeds into the growth of the rest of the world. So they should even be accepting some of these proposals in a sort of interest because Africa grows, the whole world 
grows. But Africa cannot wait to be handed uh, this opportunity by anybody else. We therefore must be on the front line, really fighting for uh, this right, and therefore for ourselves, but also which contributes to the well-being of the rest of the world. President Kagame, I want to be a little bit provocative here. I've been coming to Kenya for probably 30 years, um, and there are places that I used to know that I no longer recognize. Why? Because the city's architects have changed the landscape. Now, most of the Bretton Woods institutions were created 60 to 80 years ago at a different time from the one that we live in. So, if we're gonna talk about reform, it's not just the access to resources. It's looking at those institutions that were created back then and asking the question, are they still relevant to the needs of today? What is your thought about redesigning a lot of these institutions to make them fit for purpose? Well, absolutely. It's a no-brainer that uh, what worked uh, 50 years ago or designed 50 years ago, things have changed and therefore a rethink of a new design that fits the purpose must be into play. There's no question about it. But here what we are talking about is not simply an argument of whether you know, this is fit for purpose or this. I think everybody understands that point. Mm. But there are philosophies, if you will, or interests or that operate behind that. For us in Africa, we are hard pressed to see that there is a change of this and in the design of these institutions. But maybe the way the institutions are set up, benefiting some parts of the world, those in those parts of the world are not interested in having the change happen. Because it gives them control, it gives them say over other people's resources even. So it's not that people don't understand, especially for Africa, we understand it better of, because of how it, we are affected. But the other parts of the world that have the power and control, it's also not because they don't understand, but it is because that it serves them very well, benefits them, that they are not interested or they are slow in allowing the change to happen. So it, it's not a very complicated thing to understand. Everybody understands that. What is complicated is to reach this understanding and compromise that we don't lose anything by having everybody benefit as we should benefit all of us. That's the, where the issue lies. And therefore, the reforms are based on this thinking. We are only looking for the pathways to having the reforms implemented that provide us with less costs than uh, having to uh, fight so much over what is obvious that actually benefits all of us, as I say. Thank you very much, President Kagame. I'm going to come next to President Al Menfi. Um, let me bring it closer home. Um, obviously, your, your country has had quite a number of uh, challenges economically in recent times. What areas do you think that the African Development Bank can support Libya in the best to help you reach that last mile of reaching economic transfer, transformation in your country? Shukran jazeelan. Ana ati fursa hatta li li tarjuma inda kan fi Let me give you. 
I will talk in uh, Arabic. Uh, I'm President El Melfi, if you could just move your microphone a little bit closer to you. بداية أحب أن أشكر فخامة الرئيس روتورو على الضيافة وحسن الاستقبال والشعب الكيني وأيضا على مجهوده الكبير الذي يقوم به في هذا التحول الذي أعتبره هو نقلة مهمة جدا في التحول المالي وكيفية معالجة المؤسسات المالية في أفريقيا والحقيقة أيضا أريد أن أؤكد على نقطة أخرى وهو أن أحيانا في بعض الدول الأفريقية الحاجة تكون للعناصر الفنية وللخبرات وليس المالية وهذا ما يسمى ب التوأمة وما يسمى بالتكامل المالي داخل أفريقيا والذي نرجو أن يكون هو الطموح الذي نريد أن نصل عليه كل المؤسسات المالية أسست في فترة كانت فيها الدول الأفريقية قابعة تأت الاستعمار وبالتالي أسست وفق أليات معينة لا تخدم أفريقيا لكن أفريقيا اليوم هي أفريقيا أكثر تطوراً أفريقيا فيها العديد من الثروات من الموارد وبالتالي قدرة أفريقيا اليوم على البناء والتنمية تختلف عن أي وقت ماضي والحقيقة نحن نريد أن نؤكد على أن الدور الذي قامت به ليبيا في فترات زمنية في عدة دول أفريقية مستعدة ليبيا اليوم أنها تدعم هذا الاستثمار الذي قامت به في دول أفريقية يحتاج فقط إلى بعض الترتيبات المالية والضمانات المالية مع بعضنا كأفارقة فليبيا مثال ربما تكون ليبيا في استقرارها السياسي هي العنصر الذي سيساعد هذه المؤسسات المالية وخصوصا أننا نتحدث الآن على ثلاث مؤسسات مالية مهمة جدا والحديث فيها عن البنك الأفريقي للتنمية وكذلك البنك الأفريقي للاستثمار الذي يوجد الآن في طرابلس ونحن بصدد يعني استكمال كل الإجراءات التنفيذية الخاصة به وسيكون داعم في العديد من الدول الأفريقية وربما هو سيكون إضافة حقيقية للاستقرار المالي في أفريقيا نحن نريد أن يكون هناك أيضا تبادل ما بين سواء كان بين الدول أو على مستوى الاتحاد الأفريقي داخل ليبيا في الاستيراد والتصدير وهذا تحدث عليه فخامة الرئيس والنسب اللي تحدثوا عليها سواء كان التبادل داخل أوروبا أو آسيا نحن في أفريقيا محتاجين أن يكون عندنا هذا الأمر فليبيا هي بحاجة إلى تعاون أفريقي لأن ليبيا هي دائما تنظر إلى بعدها الأفريقي ليبيا تريد أن تستكمل كل ما بدأ تجاه أفريقيا لأننا نحن نؤمن بأن قوة ليبيا هي من قوة أفريقيا وقوة أفريقيا من قوة ليبيا وبالتالي استثماراتنا عندما تتجه إلى الجنوب خصوصا أن نحن عندنا مخططات خاصة بطرق تمتد إلى النيجر وتمتد حتى وسط أفريقيا عندنا العديد من المشاريع التي السكك الحديدية وغيرها اللي تربط شمال أفريقيا بجنوبها ومستعدين حتى في ظل الاستقرار النفطي اللي الآن تعيش فيه ليبيا أن ندعم هذه القاطرة قاطرة الإصلاح في أفريقيا ومستعدين بالتكاتف بالجهود مع فخامة الرؤساء لهذا العمل شكرا
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prime Minister, very much. Uh, I mean, President uh, al Menfi. greatly appreciated uh, capacity building, cooperation, and um, consulting on a regional basis. Um, I'm going to come next to uh, Prime Minister Sarah Kugongelwa Amadila. Kindly forgive me. I, I know that my pronunciation is not uh, too um, correct, but please forgive me here. I'm very, very particular about pronouncing names properly. Now, your country, Namibia, um, was one of the first to attain upper middle income status in Africa. A great accomplishment. What are some of the lessons that the rest of Africa can take away from Namibia in this regard? I think your microphone is off. Yes, thank you very much, moderator. And I would like to extend our appreciation to President Ruto for the invitation extended to our president to attend. Fortunately, unfortunately, he could not attend due to other commitment and has asked me to represent him. Yes, Namibia has achieved the status of an upper middle income country. We decided right after independence, which came after a prolonged uh, bloody armed struggle, that uh, we are going to promote peace and stability uh, so that we can inspire the confidence of investors to come to the country and we can create an environment where economic activities can be pursued so that development is achieved. We also adopted economic policies that ensured macroeconomic stability and also uh, incentivized investors, both local and international, to come to the country. We invested significantly in infrastructure and in the development of the human capital. We have a very youthful population. We still have challenges in that regard, but education and training continues to be uh, a, a priority. In spite, I must say, of the fact that we have managed to record positive economic growth almost every year since independence, except uh, in a few years when we were faced with emergencies like COVID, droughts, and, and floods, and we are very prone to these disasters. We, however, still face challenges of inequities. Uh, the bulk of the population who are the indigenous communities uh, living in poverty and much of the wealth is owned by Namibians of European extraction. So that is one of the serious challenges that we have to address. The second challenge is the fact that because we are a commodity-based economy for the most part, the growth in GDP did not necessarily translate in, in proportional growth in employment and poverty reduction. So although we have reduced poverty, we still have significant number of people that are poor, and also many of our young people are still struggling to find employment. So uh, we consider it a priority to diversify the economy, to promote value addition, so that we can create jobs and also reduce the vulnerability of the economy to external shocks, including the shocks to droughts and floods. And actually, as we speak now, Namibia is experiencing one of the worst droughts that we, that we have faced. About one million people are depending on government support to be able to, um, to, to survive because the harvest was very poor, the rains were late and uh, grossly inadequate. So we do have those uh, challenges. And uh, we are also prioritizing, because we are a small population, we are only 3 million, and we are vast in terms of infrastructure. It's very costly to put them up. We are prioritizing integration with the rest of the continent so that uh, we are not limited in what we produce by our, our small population. Well, thank you very much, Prime Minister Madila. Very much appreciated. I'm going to come next to His Excellency Musa Faki. Mohammad, now in your position as a U chairperson, you have a front row seat on what's going on in different parts of the continent. Um, what's your assessment of the progress that we're making in terms of uh, structural reforms on the continent? Are we on track or is there much more that we need to do? Uh, merci beaucoup. 
Euh, je voudrais rappeler qu'il y a quatre jours, nous avons célébré le 61e anniversaire de l'Organisation de l'Unité africaine qui est devenue en 2002 l'Union africaine. La BAD également a 60 ans. La BAD est l'une des institutions qui a été expressément chargée par l'Union africaine à mobiliser des ressources pour la mise en œuvre de l'agenda 2063 que nous nous sommes donné au 50e anniversaire de notre organisation. Il y a huit ans, en juillet 2016, à Kigali, la conférence des chefs d'État a évalué la situation du continent et a décidé d'une réforme institutionnelle et financière de l'Union africaine. Cette tâche a été demandée expressément au président Paul Kagame, qui a fait un excellent travail et il a passé les témoins au cours du dernier sommet au président Routou. Parce que nous nous sommes rendus compte qu'il faut nécessairement, pour pouvoir compter sur le plan international, il faut que nous-mêmes, à l'intérieur du continent, nous nous réformions. Nous avons un agenda très ambitieux, l'agenda 2063. Et il nous faut d'abord faire des réformes de notre institution qui est l'Union africaine pour pouvoir parler d'une seule voix. Parce que l'Afrique, ses ressources sont connues. D'abord, les ressources humaines, 1,400 million d'habitants, 30 millions de kilomètres carrés, des ressources naturelles innombrables, mais malgré tout ça, nous n'avons pas pu réaliser les attentes des populations africaines. Donc, la première des choses, c'est une réforme endogène au sein du continent pour nous donner les meilleurs moyens pour pouvoir discuter sur l'arène internationale. Cette réforme est en cours. Des progrès importants ont été réalisés, mais il n'en demeure pas moins que nous faisons face, il faut le dire honnêtement, encore à des réflexes de souveraineté étriqués au niveau des États. L'Afrique ne peut compter qu'unie, intégrée. C'est ça la, le sens de l'agenda 2063, que veut une Afrique intégrée, prospère et en paix. Sur le plan international, les institutions de Bretton Woods, l'Organisation des Nations Unies, toutes sont la résultante de la Seconde Guerre mondiale. Ce sont ceux qui étaient les vainqueurs qui ont mis en place ces institutions. 70, 80 ans après, il est évident que ces institutions ont vécu. Ce ne sont plus les mêmes défis, ce n'est plus la même configuration, ni sur le plan démographique, ni sur le plan géopolitique, ni sur le plan financier. Il y a une nécessité de réformer ces institutions, notamment les institutions financières. L'Afrique a été le cobaye, il faut le dire, à différentes approche le programme d'ajustement structurel dans leurs différentes phases, comment il faut réduire la pauvreté. Toutes ces politiques ont montré leurs limites. Aujourd'hui, l'Afrique vient avec ses priorités, avec une planification bien établie et demande à la communauté internationale. Ce n'est pas une charité, c'est de pouvoir accepter l'Afrique dans sa diversité avec son potentiel et la traiter seulement d'égal avec les autres régions du monde pour lui donner la possibilité de se développer. Je crois qu'il y a un travail important à faire et il faut que les partenaires, ceux qui tiennent le haut du pavé, puissent comprendre la nécessité. Si on veut un monde pacifique, un monde solidaire, il faut nécessairement voir l'Afrique d'une autre façon. Il n'en demeure pas moins que pour nous, nous-mêmes, il faut qu'on améliore notre gouvernance, qu'elle soit politique, institutionnelle, économique et financière, mais il faut également que la communauté internationale, si on veut un monde de stabilité, revoie également ces règles qui ont été édictées il y a 80 ans et qui ne correspondent pas du tout à la réalité d'aujourd'hui. Voilà où nous nous trouvons. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. I'm, and I'm going to um, go just from the point you just made right now over to uh, President Kagame. Now, no one is in any doubt that 
uh, reshaping and reforming the global financial architecture is going to be a walk in the park. It's, go it's going to have its own challenges. Um, and it would seem that doing so, the reforms that we need are going to be both short-term and long-term. This being the case, what must Africa do to ensure that it strengthens its voice and it is able to engage in ongoing conversations on reforming the global financial architecture. What is it that we need to do on a consistent basis? So this isn't just a one-off conversation. What are the things that we need to do in the global space? We must walk the talk. Because we have discussed these issues for many years as I can remember. And we are saying the right things. So we must start doing the right things that we know how. One is being together. We must, as I said, the unit of our continent through the African Union and other institutions, including this bank, that invited us here, the African Development Bank. It's all about Africa. First of all, we must have it in our mind. And therefore, there is a need for mindset change from the past to the present. And we cannot be served well in our intentions for the future if you are not thinking correctly, acting correctly right now. So when we have been talking about the African Union reforms, as uh, uh, His Excellency President Ruto, my brother, mentioned earlier, you know, we, when, before I handed over to the President, I had been carrying out these tasks. I mean, I, there is no secret here, I just, uh, say it as it is. We agreed many things. Most of the countries were represented in the room, heads of state and government. We have agreed many things that need to be done because it is right and it is the only thing that can deliver what we want. Few years later, two years maybe from the time we decided, we have discussions in Addis at the African Union headquarters. You find some of the 50% oh, of the things we agreed have changed. And you're asking the same leaders in the room, you say, what happened? What we are saying now that we must be doing is what we agreed two years ago. Why? have we not done exactly what we agreed? And nobody gives an answer. So we, are, we cannot escape this. We cannot escape doing the very things we have agreed to do because we know that is what is going to deliver what we want for our continent. There is no other way I can put it. There is no magic wand that is going, that is in anybody's hand to bring the change that we want. So when we are here discussing, and everybody is listening, and we are listening to ourselves, we must get out of this room with a commitment, a conviction, that we can actually deliver what the continent wants, and we are the ones to do that. The rest will continue to be discussions back and forth, speeches back and forth, but we will not get the results. But some progress has been made. It is a slow progress. Even then we are saying we can't afford to move slowly. It's urgent. It's long overdue. So that's what we need to be working on as uh, we move forward and that's the hard task 
I, I, I was happy to hand over to my brother here to <laughs> he's younger, so I think he has the what it takes to do that. In but other, we he will really need our support, all of us. And I, and I believe that President Ruto indeed will move with speed as he has shown um, even here in Kenya, and we believe that he will do the same. With regards to the global financial architecture, how, how do you see that dovetailing into the ambitions of Agenda 2063? I think that... And I ask that question because a lot has happened, mm. and a lot has changed, and a lot has tran been transformed on the global scene since uh, Agenda 2063 came into place. And that's still a long way off. But what are your thoughts in this regard? Uh, I would like to thank the President Kagame and the President Ruto who led this important reform au sein of the Union African. It is evident that if we are going to be dispersed, we can't be influenced on the reform of the international financial institutions. Ça, c'est une évidence. Et donc, plus nous travaillons pour resserrer les rangs, partir avec une position commune africaine, mieux c'est pour nous pour pouvoir espérer modifier les règles qui sont en cours. Aujourd'hui, l'Afrique a une image qui n'est pas la photographie réelle du continent. On nous prend comme un continent à risque et donc les taux sont extrêmement élevés. Le président Ruto l'a dit, il a donné des chiffres, peut-être 9 fois, 10 fois les taux qui sont euh, 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 utilisés ailleurs. Et donc, pour pouvoir financer euh, l'agenda 2063, et notamment les projets phares sur lesquels travaille le NEPAD, l'ODA NEPAD, la Banque africaine de développement et les autres institutions, y compris la Commission de l'Union africaine, on a besoin de financement. Et ces financements ne peuvent pas être mobilisés uniquement en Afrique. Il faut ex évidemment que les règles en matière d'investissement, en matière de taux, soient révisées pour que le continent africain puisse, comme les autres régions du monde, pouvoir être investi sur le marché international. L'effort africain est en train d'être fait. Il faut bien que la communauté internationale, les systèmes international lui-même s'adapte pour pouvoir, de manière juste et équitable, donner la chance au continent africain de pouvoir se développer. On ne peut pas continuer à être juste un réservoir de matières premières, un champ de bataille géopolitique, et c'est ça les risques majeurs. Nous avons été un théâtre, et nous risquons encore d'être un théâtre dans la bataille des grandes puissances économiques, et c'est ça les risques les plus importants. Plus Nous, en notre sein, il faut qu'on travaille en rang serré pour pouvoir parler d'une seule voix et constituer une force de négociation avec les partenaires. Parce que l'un des pas importants de notre agenda, c'est également le partenariat. On ne peut pas se développer à, à, en autarcie, c'est évident. Et donc, il nous faut pouvoir, dans le cadre de notre partenariat, parler d'une seule voix. Malheureusement, je, suis, je regrette de le dire, Jusqu'à là, nous n'avons pas cette force unificatrice qui parle d'une seule voix qui peut peser réellement sur euh, l'ordre des choses. Donc c'est un défi à la fois pour nous-mêmes, sur nous-mêmes et vis-à-vis -vis de la communauté internationale, notamment les institutions financières internationales. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Um, I'm just going to... Uh, provide each one of our panelists with um, a closing comment as we bring this session to a close, uh, keeping in mind again the theme of this conversation, Africa's transformation agenda. But I'd like you to focus in on what the African Development Bank can still do to help achieve the agenda. Yes. You've been very glowing in all of your assessments and the reports on the bank and the work that uh, Dr. Adishina and the rest of his team are doing. What is that extra mile that the African Development Bank needs to take to help unleash some of the potential 
and bring to fruition the ideas that we're talking about today. I'm going to start with Her Excellency, the Prime Minister of Namibia first and work our way backwards, but leave the last word for President Ruto. Yes, thank you very much. <clears throat> I would say first we applaud the ADB for the work that it has done uh, in terms of mobilizing funding and the good governance that uh, is prevailing at the institution that inspires the um, trust of the partners to work with the bank to raise funds to support uh, development uh, in Africa. Well, the first point that I would like to raise is one that relates to funding for middle-income countries, drawing from the experience of Namibia. This is a challenge that we face everywhere, including at the ADB. Because of the higher per capita income, in spite of the inequities that I have referred to, the high unemployment and high levels of poverty, we get funding that is um, quite pricey. Uh, making it difficult for us to, to raise the adequate resources to fund development. Secondly, uh, I would advise the bank, and I think it is amenable in that regard, as we do also advise other funders to look at how their support can assist countries to develop their local capital markets. Because Namibia is one of those countries that have a relatively developed capital market, but not optimally developed to be able to ensure intermediation. We actually export capital, whereas we, we, we borrow externally. So that is an aspect that is very important for us. Then there is the issue of, of funding to private sector, apart from funding government without the requirement of government to provide um, a collateral and uh, partnering with private financial institutions so that their capacity that is here is also shared with African financial institutions to be able to support development in those countries. And uh, obviously we would like funding to really prioritize growth enhancing measures, you know, measures that support economic uh, growth, that support diversification and value adding. We are mineral resources endowed as a continent but because mining itself is not job intensive, we need to develop the full value chain of our mineral resources. And we thank the bank for advocating for increased special drawing rights for, for African countries. And we would like it to also amplify the voice of middle income countries so that we can raise more uh, resources. Uh, there have been talks about also equity in terms of the uh, uh, harnessing of benefits from natural resources. Uh, this is something that is important for us as African countries, being the host of most of the resources. We want to share equitably in the benefits and supporting capacity to fight illicit flows of capital uh, so that we obviate the need for our countries to rely on external borrowings. Countries like Namibia could actually develop self-sufficiency in terms of funding if we can address illicit flows and we can optimize capital markets development. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prime Minister, Prime Minister Amadia. Very excellent points, and I'm sure Dr. Adishna is listening. Um, thank you very much for your input there. We're going to come next to President Kagame. I will try to be very brief. I think uh, very good points have been made by the Prime Minister of Namibia. But I want to thank the African Development Bank's uh, president and his team who have done a very good job of mobilizing resources for our continent and also leveraging them, those resources, to uh, broaden the investments as we need them on our continent. And um, I would only, with the, the support of everyone on our continent, we would urge him to even mobilize more resources, especially the private sector uh, resources to be invested on our continent because uh, other uh, sources are not enough in and of themselves. We have seen, for example, uh, the time 
of COVID and uh, uh, towards the end, when uh, the SDRs that were mobilized, we had, uh, had uh, 5% of that, of the 650 billion that was, so 5% of that for the whole continent of Africa is very small. So whichever uh, sources we have uh, alone, they are not enough. We need uh, to diversify, uh, therefore, the sources of the money that we need to invest on our continent. And uh, I think that helps uh, development of Africa to realize the agenda that is set for the 2063. And uh, therefore, I thank all the leaders of our continent uh, so that we continue to work together to support uh, Africa Development Bank institution. Thank you very much, President Kagame. And we'll go next to President Al Menfi uh, for your thoughts in this regard. Shukran, shukran jazeera. Aydan, ana uhaul an ikhtisab uakid aydan ala ان الدور اللي يقوم به البنك الافريقي للتنميه في افريقيا وما سمعنا عليه حتى من خلال العرض اليوم هو دور مهم جدا ونحن ندعم هذا الدور ومستعدين ان نكون في دعمنا اكثر تطورا خلال الفتره القادمه في مجالات عده وايضا كيفيه التعاون وبيننا وبين هذا البنك خلال الفترة القادمة حتى نطور من ليبيا ومن أفريقيا بشكل عام ولكن أريد أن أؤكد على أن السير في مسيرة الإصلاح في المؤسسات المالية الدولية اللي نحن تحدثنا عنها لابد أن يكون هو الحفاظ على موقف موحد أفريقي والتمسك به حتى نتمكن من الانتهاء من تأسيس المؤسسات المالية الأفريقية ومنها على سبيل المثال المصرف الأفريقي للاستثمار اللي تحدثت عليه واللي نتمنى أن الدول اللي لم تحتمد هذا المصرف تقوم بالاعتماد لأنه سيكون عنصر من عناصر البناء في أفريقيا وعلينا جميعا كقادة فارقة أن ننفذ مقررات الاتحاد الأفريقي والتي تمثل مواقف موحدة. شكرا جزيلا. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, and last, well, not last actually, we're, because we're going to come to President Ruto later on. I'm going to ask uh, the AU Chair, Musafaki, for your thoughts in this regard. Um, let me congratulate uh, FDB and this team, and particularly my brother, Dr. Adesina. They did very well, and they're doing very well. I hope uh, they will act in the future in complementarity and also in coordination with other partners in the continent because we have also a partnership with China, with India, with Arab countries through the Islamic Development Bank. And I think uh, this coordination and this complementarity uh, will uh, allow us to implement the, our agenda, the 2063 Agenda, African Agenda. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency. Um, one of the recurring uh, comments here uh, concerns the private sector and the resources that are needed. And as Dr. Adishina has said um, quite recently, uh, there is a need for reform of the MDBs, but in particular the African Development Bank, to change its instruments in ways that enable it to be much more active in the private sector. So we, we do trust and hope that as uh, leaders, uh, that both yourself and your governors will support the bank in that regard 
to enable it to do a whole lot more. We're going to give the last word at this point to our host, President William Samoy Ruto. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Let me thank um, fellow panelists here for all the very positive and informative comments they have made about this very important subject. Let me pick up from where President Kagame left. He said, he told us, let's begin by believing in ourselves. I think it's a very important issue that we must believe in ourselves first. And we must stop outsourcing problems we have created or outsourcing solutions we can provide for ourselves. There are things we can do to sort out some of the challenges we are facing. And in the context of uh, Africa Development Bank, we all admit that Africa Development Bank has demonstrated understanding of our financial needs, and they have developed innovative instruments to work on food security, infrastructure, water development, uh, youth uh, uh, entrepreneurship, women. They, they have demonstrated what ADB wants or needs from us is to us to believe in them the way they believe in us. Provide support for ADB, and that is why we are voicing our support for replenishment of ADF, $25 billion. We are enhancing our own support through enhancing our shareholding in Africa Development Bank. We must support these institutions. Africa Development Bank here, AFRIEXIM, Trade Development Bank, all the other financial institutions in our continent. We must give them the stamp of approval as leaders in this continent and support them. That way, they can support us. Secondly, we must believe in ourselves. You know, President Kagame warned me when he handed over the baton of this reform to me that this job is not very easy. And that uh, you have heard him say, we need to move fast. Luckily, I come from a country of athletes. So running fast will not be a problem. My only worry is that we should not leave anybody behind so that, so that we can move together. And hopefully, we are all listening as leaders here that we need to believe in ourselves. Whatever, we must walk the talk. We must believe in ourselves. We must do this because it is necessary for us. We can never go wrong by doing the right thing. And finally, let me ask ADB, looking into the future, to give them two assignments. We need to write a new narrative for Africa. We have been profiled negatively for far too long. Please, if you can support an Africa credit rating agency that will be factual about the situation in Africa. Let me give you an example. We went to the market as Kenya. And then there was a situation in Niger. And we were told, you are going to pay two points more because there was a situation in Niger. Niger is very far from Kenya. You know? But somewhere, somebody sitting in Washington or some other place thinks Niger is in Nairobi. You know? So please, if you can work on an Africa credit agency that will help put factual information into the financial architecture, 
so that this unnecessary risk profiling is reduced. <laughs> Let me ask you for one more thing, which you believe in, uh, Mr. Adesina, before you leave office next year, before you move on to another assignment. You have talked about undervaluation of our GDP as a continent. But in the calculation of our GDP, the huge resources, mineral resources that we have are not factored. The huge energy resources, renewable energy resources are not factored. The huge resources we have, having 60% of Africa's, of the world's actually, remaining uncultivated arable, arable land is not factored. Our provision of natural carbon sinks is not factored in our GDP. And that is why most of the time we are told our debt is not sustainable because our own GDP is not correctly evaluated. Please, if you can work with us to get the true valuation of our GDP so that we can drive Africa's development in a positive manner. I don't think those are, those are too many assignments, uh, Desina. I am very, uh, I'm, I'm very, I'm, I'm, I'm very optimistic that these are assignments you can undertake on all our behalf as we drive the continent's uh, prosperity into the future. And thank you very much. Excellent closing thoughts from President Ruto. Support the bank strongly. Stop outsourcing problems and stop outsourcing solutions that we have answers for. Believe in ourselves. Write a new narrative. Develop, as a matter of urgency, an African credit rating agency, as well as re-evaluate our resources. Excellent closing thoughts. I want to say a very big thank you to all of our presidential delegates, um, our panelists, during this session for your excellent thoughts. You've given us much food for thought. Again, we thank you, President Ruto, President Kagame, President Al Menfi, Prime Minister Kugon Gelwa Amadia, and AU Commission Chair Musa Faki. Thank you for enriching our conversation this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, could you kindly give our distinguished presidential panelists a warm round of applause and thank them for their leadership of our continent.